Welcome to Laptop Radio. Today's topic is moving into NFT and metaverse as a celebrity artist and musician with Tokyo Cyberhearts. And we have Damon Sharp here with us. He's an artist, producer, and musician. Hello, Damon. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for having me, Michelle. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us your story? Yes, my name is Damon Sharp. I actually wear a lot of hats. I'm a producer, a songwriter, a DJ, and an artist. So I do a lot. I'll try not to give you the long story, but I'll give you a little bit of my history. I actually moved to LA as a teenager at about 15. My parents moved out so I could pursue my career. At that time, I was kind of doing a little bit of everything. I was dancing, I was acting, I was singing, kind of the jack of all trades, master of none. But it was my start to my journey. When I got here, I was really fortunate. I started booking a lot of jobs and as a dancer, believe it or not, first and foremost. So I booked like a Nintendo commercial then a Pepsi commercial, then a Universal Studios commercial. And that kind of really got my feet wet in, in the entertainment industry. And then I was fortunate enough after that, I booked a TV show on NBC on Saturday mornings, which was on right after Saved by the Bell, if you're familiar with that. And it was almost like a knockoff of New Kids on the Block. We had our own <laughs> record deal on EMI. We had dolls, we had a board game, pajamas, the whole deal you can imagine. Uh, we kind of went from being teenagers to being super famous overnight. At that point, we didn't have streaming. There was very minimal cable network. Networks. If you were on one of the major networks, it was like overnight, you got some traction that started going. I did that for about a year and a half. And then at the end of that year and a half, it literally came to a halt. They canceled the show. The record deal got repealed. I always tell people I literally went from taking pictures with Will Smith to fast forward two years later, serving him a Pepsi as a waiter. It was a crazy, crazy, crazy life lesson, but one that needed to be had because teenage Damon thought he was super cool. You can't blame a teenager who blows up overnight to be like, yeah, I'm super cool and I'm going to, I'm never going to have to work in my life. But of course, of course, higher power, whoever that is said, hey, Damon, that's not the case. Slam me down to earth. It kind of made me reassess my life. And I went through a couple of dark years and trying to decide what I was going to do. Obviously, we only had a very small fraction of fame, but just seeing that I can imagine how some of these people, like the Lindsay Lohans and the Demi Lovatos, they get everything so young. It's so hard. It's traumatic. If you're not always at the top of your game, it's an yeah. up and down roller coaster. I was fortunate. My parents are amazing. They supported me. I had great friends. And at one point, I just got to a place where I was like, what are you doing? Like, stop being a victim. I got therapy for myself. All of a sudden, I was working. I was waiting tables. I was going to school. I was taking every penny I could and putting it into my career of working at a studio to cleaning toilets, whatever I had to do to, to get my foot in the door. And funny as it is, of course, as it started going, things started manifesting because I was putting in the work and I put my ego aside. And then I met my mentor by the name of, of Rick Wake, who's one of the most famous producers of all time. He's produced for everybody. He's got multiple Grammys. And he put me in yet another boy band after the first boy band I did. And I spent three years working with him, going through three different record labels with this boy band. It never ended up manifesting. The name of the band was ironically unheard of which was probably a self-fulfilling prophecy. It never came to see the light of day, but it allowed me for three years to hone my skills as a producer, a writer, and kind of sit over the shoulders of these great producers and writers and, and watch Rick work. It came to the end of the three years and we got offered another deal, which was with Warner Brothers. And at the time, I, oh God, I really needed that money. And I think we were getting like 25 grand a piece or something. And I was like, oh my God, this is life-changing. But in my heart, I knew it wasn't the right situation for me. I passed on it and went back to being on unemployment for the second time in my life. And uh, what am I going to do? I just kind of went to a free fall moment and literally go back to business, just trying to make things happen. Yeah. And all of a sudden as fate would have it about a month later, I get a call from Rick and he's like, dude, I found this CD of songs that you wrote on my desk. There's some really good songs on here. He's like, did you write these? I was like, yeah, yeah. I said, I said I've been trying to tell you for three years. I'm not just the boy band kid. I really want to produce some songs. And he's like, all right. He's like, you know what? Let me go shop these songs for you. I'm going to get back to you. So I'm like, all right, great. Perfect. I hang up the phone. I'm like, I'm never going to hear back. And I go back to my business. Say about a month later, he calls again. And he's like, Damon, guess what? I got some good news. I placed a couple of your songs. And I'm like, oh, okay. At the time, I didn't really understand what the gravity of that was. He's like, do you know who Jennifer Lopez is? And I was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, of course. I was like, I like her. But she wasn't quite J-Lo yet. She was Jennifer Lopez, but she hasn't fully connected yet. I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. He's like, she wants to do your song, Why Did You Lie to Me? I was like, great. And he goes, do you know who Anastasia is? I was like, I don't. And he goes, she's blowing up overseas. He's like, she wants to do your song, Love Don't Cost a Thing. And I'm like, okay, this is cool. And he's like, all right, I'm going to get back to you. We hang up again. Again, I just go about my business. I'm a little jaded at this point. I'm like, I don't know if I'll ever hear back. So <laughs> then another month goes by. And then I get a, a weird call out of the blue from one of my friends who was interning at a record label. And she's like, Damon, she's like, did you do a song for Jennifer Lopez? And I was like, 
maybe, I'm not sure. And she's like, go to the newsstand right now, flip it over to the back and call me back. Well, this is crazy. So I fly to the newsstand, I flip it over, it's r, &R Magazine. And on the back, it says, Jennifer Lopez, Love No Cost a Thing, the iconic midriff shot of her. And I'm like, written by Damon Sharp and my co-writers. I'm like, wow, so I call Rick. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I didn't want to jinx it. He goes, it literally went from Jennifer changing hands. Anastasia took, why'd you lie to me? Jennifer took Love No Cost a Thing to not making her record, to being on the record, to being the first single in a matter of days. Yeah. So it all manifested. And then at that point, it all went into hyperspeed. He's like, all right, are you going to come work with me as a writer now and sign with me? I'm like, of course, of course, bro. <laughs> so at that point, and, and that was over 20 years ago and I haven't looked back, but the irony is as soon as that started connecting, all the people that had no time for me suddenly started coming out of the woodworks. Oh, Damon, we'd love to work with you. We want to really want to be in business with you. And I'm like, you didn't want to be in business with me before. Rick did. I'm signing with Rick. Yeah. yeah. So I signed with him. We had an amazing seven year run together. We worked on tons of projects together. Then after that, I ended up doing a deal with Sony ATV and I was there for five years. And then since then, now I've just kind of been doing what's called an admin situation with different companies so I can actually retain the ownership in my copyrights. And then they just administer and collect the monies for me. I and mean, that just seems to work out better for me at this point. Obviously, I still continue to produce and write all the time. But about three years ago, I got a bug up my butt again. I was getting a little burnt out on just producing and writing all the time. And my attorney was like, well, why aren't you doing an artist project? And I'm like, oh, it's too late in my career. But he's like, no, forget that. He's like, stop, stop doubting yourself. He's like, stop, put away the fear and pride let, and go for it. He's like, if you start spinning again and start DJing, he's like, then it can be your artist project, a la a Diplo, a Mark Bronson, a Zed, any of these guys. I was like, all right, you know what? Why not? And I literally went out the next day and I had previously DJed on, on turntables, but never on CDJs. I literally the next day went and got all the industry standard equipment. I hired a DJ mentor and he went in with me for like a year. And I just honed up in my back studio and just got my skill set up. And oh, wow. sure enough, as I was doing that, I started releasing singles on Armada, Dirty Work, Spin, and all these different labels. And they started connecting weirdly. Now I'm about 73 million streams just as an artist and DJ, not to mention the 2 billion that I'm approaching now as a, a producer and a writer and an engineer. Yeah. What I thought was a, like a passion side project has now become more than that. In addition to my production and songwriting, I can do that. A long-winded story, but that will lead into where I'm at now, where I met you, Michelle, and you're one of the first people that really embraced me and helped me into the space of NFTs. And I've, I've been learning so much and Obviously, we've got our project now that is probably the, our first of many, Tokyo Cyber Hearts. I've got the shirt on. I'm super excited about it. <laughs> yes, I just wanted to say that I listened to your DJ at South by Southwest for the first time. Of course, I listened to your music. It was really good. And Thank you. Thank you. We were just telling everyone <laughs> about how awesome the music, it just makes you dance. I was like, oh my gosh, it was oh, really you. good. And I go to Coachella and Burning Man and a lot of music festivals and just wanted to let you know that. Oh, I'm happy. That's, that's really what I want to do. I'm not one of those like cool kid DJs that tries to be Joe Cool. Like I want to make people dance. I want to dance. Like if I'm having a good time, then I want the audience to have a good time, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I was just at ETH Denver and I've, I've heard of Marshmallow and Trieste, but like, I thought, I thought yours yes, was- so. Yes, yeah, so. that? <laughs> oh, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. I'll take yeah, that as a compliment. yeah. I mean, I don't the other guys, it's not going to kill me. <laughs> well, they're amazing. I've, I've seen them play too. I've been a fan of EDM for like over a decade and I've gone to a lot of shows. So for me, like even when I was prepping my last EDC set, which I'm actually playing on, I'm not allowed to fully announce it yet, but yeah. Anyway, I, I just played EDC in October. And when I prepped that set, I watched a lot of my guys that I look up to. I watched their previous sets at EDC, yeah. Tomorrowland, Ultra, because everybody's so different the way they curate their sets, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, of course, NFTs and metaverses, because you're moving into NFTs and metaverse, which we call Web3 as yep. an artist. How does that feel for you? It's incredible. I think we've talked about this before. It feels like a whole new chapter. And for someone who came in right at the tail end of physical CDs, permanent temporary downloads, and then streaming to see something where we can actually can kind of control our own destinies and have ownership in the IP, as opposed to having super, super ridiculously fractional ownership. Like in the past, if a label made $7, they're giving you like 10 cents. So what you would make, even if you sold millions of records, was minute. The sky's the limit of the things we can do. Do with nfts but not only that then we can actually monetize it honestly like i've been very blessed to, to be at a place where i can support myself and my family solely with music but a lot yeah. of people i know that are way more talented than me can't do that they just don't make enough money maybe this is a way for them to start monetizing and being able to make a living in music or in art or i mean there's so many yeah. facets right of nfts that's what i love about it 
Yeah, I I love that too. It's a whole new art renaissance. And I love that artists could make money directly from their consumers and the people who actually support them. And then there's also secondary sales too, that you Mm -hmm. earn royalty. Because I think traditionally agencies and other middlemen usually get most of the cut. And artists don't really get that much, you know, in general. But I'm really excited about that part. We're working on a project together and your Genesis drop is called Tokyo Cyber Hearts. We took Damon's music that he made exclusively for the drop, for the NFT collection. And we basically put it into 30 pieces. There's 30 kinds of hearts and each heart contains one piece of his music. And if you get one of the heart, you can get an airdrop of the entire song. But when you're making the music, what are some of your thoughts around that? I mean, it's different. You guys kind of already had some visuals that were jogging my creative juices. It came pretty quickly. I actually kind of came up with the melody before I even did the track. I just kind of threw up a basic tech house drum kind of progression. And I kind of heard the, a lot of the lyrics and melody in my brain. I laid that down, obviously processed my, my voice <laughs> crazy because I wanted to sound kind of futuristic and cool. And then it just kind of came together after that. Uh, obviously, a, a lot of iterations of it to get it to where it became the final product. But yeah, that's, that was kind of part of the journey. That's awesome. Like, I had a vision of the heart and I didn't really know who I'm going to be working with. But a couple of months before, one morning I woke up with a just beating heart, but more of the heart 3D. Then we met you. That was super synchronistic and awesome. Yeah, absolutely. How is it like? Just really being in the Web3 space, how is that different from before? We just talked about this last week at South By. It's kind of like, it's such an embraceive community. And not that the music community isn't embraceive, but they just get a little weird and secretive and competitive. And the Web3 space is is the exact opposite. It doesn't matter what level you're at, they're all willing to help. And it's so embraceive. It's a community. And that's what I really love about it. At least the people I've come across, there's not a lot of egos. Even the most successful people are like, hey, hit me up. I'll talk to you about it. What do you want to do? Let's see if something makes sense. That's really cool. And and like I said, also just the fact that it's kind of like, if you can imagine it, you can you can build it into something in, in, in Web3, whether it's in the metaverse and NFT, but blockchain, there's so many different facets of it that are all kind of going from zero to a hundred all at once now. The Genesis piece is collaboration with the Fantasy and also Ram, the Tokyo Cyberheart. We're going to do a concert in the metaverse. Metaverse is for me, it's the intersection between VR and, and AR and, and everything that is digital. How does it feel to be a digital avatar? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And just in seeing the preview of what it's going to look like, I know it's going to morph a little bit, but just in seeing the original design yeah. that you guys did, it's incredible. You know what I mean? It's, it's <laughs> mind-blowing. Mind and it's fun. Like I said, it's not only cool, but, but there's just such a fun factor behind it to be able to choose the way that you're going to look and yeah. you know I can still play my set and my avatar is actually playing the set the same time I am that's so cool yeah we're looking forward to that what do you think the future of nft and metaverses will be for artists and musicians i mean i think in a dream scenario we're going to incorporate everything like we're going to use nfts for art we're going to use it for music we're going to use it for concert tickets there's so many uses and same same thing with the metaverse i don't think traditional shows will ever go away but why not be able to do both what what happens if i break my leg and i can't tour maybe i can do a a 10 series metaverse concert you know what i mean like and i don't have to go anywhere you playing at EDC last October? Yes. Near Money 2020. You've played at all these places and then you're going to have a concert in the metaverses. Do you think that your community who will support you will be different? Do you think that they will overlap? That's a good question because I feel like we're such in the baby phases. You and I are are trying to be on the forefront of it, but the average Joe is kind of clueless to be honest with yeah. you. So I'm doing my best to try to educate people. But even then, I think it may be probably pretty different audiences, but hopefully some overlap because a lot of people, even with the NFT, they kind of give up. They're like, oh, I don't well, I have to create a MetaMask. I have to mint it. I don't even know what that means. What's Ethereum and what's blockchain? They don't know what a lot of it is. I think as we are moving into the adoption phase, or at least yeah. from a mass public, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. But right now I'm just happy. Hey, even if five people show up, if 500 people show up, obviously we don't have enough computing power to get 500, but you know what I mean? Like I'm hoping it's going to be a, a good turnout and I don't care how many it is. We're going to have a great time and hopefully people will show up. And like I said, I think hopefully some of my hardcore fans will be open to the process it takes to get on and not get to yeah. But I think, like I said, that's just a learning curve, you know? Yeah, no, no, it's true. I don't think that the technology is there or it's in place yet. I had a friend who wanted to buy an NFT and 
he was on MetaMask and was just like, can we use Apple Pay and credit card? And we did that, <laughs> we did that on MetaMask and it still didn't really? go through. Yeah, yeah. He KYC, uh, he entered his driver license and the Apple Pay function didn't work on MetaMask. Uh, and then the credit card one didn't work neither. And it's been like a week and I've been helping him. Yeah. I don't think the technology has really been there, even if you don't want to use Coinbase the other partnerships that they have aren't perfect yet. I think it's fine. I think it's still a learning curve for everyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Is there anything else you wanted to share that I have not asked you? Wow. I tried to touch on a lot of things. I'm excited about my radio show, Insomniac Radio Show called Bring Jack Radio. Right now it's monthly, but it's going to be moving to bi-monthly and then we're going to expand into about 15 more markets. But right now you can tune in on the second Wednesday of every month and, and hear an hour of curated music from me. And I talk a little bit about why I made my song selections and talk about what's going on with me currently. And it's all kind of very, very real time updates, which is great. And I'm also going to be launching my own label by the same name, which will also be called Brain Jack. And that's kind of a curated boutique dance label. I'm super excited about that too. Awesome. You released a few songs lately. Tell us about them. Yeah. The, the latest one is a song called Spontaneous. And mm -hmm. that was released for a label called Loud Cult, which is ba based out of Sweden. Mm -hmm. And that one's really cool. We just put out the lyric video. And then I also have one called First Time that's out on Armada. And that one is with Vivid collaboration. And that one's very cool, kind of anthemic. We also just put a lyric video for that. That's kind of very like almost metaverse-like. It's a very Blade Runner colors and, and kind of cyberpunk kind of vibes. Obviously more are coming, but those are my current ones that I'm really pushing. And yeah, there's a few new ones coming that I can't talk about yet, but that I'm super excited about. Awesome. Where do people find Brain Jack? The radio show? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's on Insomniac Radio, but you can also find it after the fact on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, MixCloud, 1001 Tracklist. It's on all of those. Just put in Brain Jack Radio. Awesome. And then how about your songs? I found you on Instagram. That was really cool. If you go to music and type in Damon Sharp, you'll find all his music and you can use That's it. That's true. Instagram. That's true. Absolutely. Yeah, please do that. But all platforms, I'm at Damon Sharp. And then obviously Spotify, Apple Music, I'm on all the DSPs. But like you said, if the easiest way to find me is almost every platform is just Damon Sharp. Maybe my YouTube might be different, but everything else is all at Damon Sharp and the Sharp has an E on it. Okay. Awesome. But please join our discord. We're really trying to build that community and also any of the socials with Damon Sharp NFT because we're playing catch up a little bit. We launched our NFT and I don't know if we had fully built our community. We had a proper web two fan base, but not web three. We definitely would appreciate if you guys can help us out there. The website for that is Linktree Damon Sharp NFT and you'll find the discord channel there. Awesome. And people love the hearts. People love it and it's pretty awesome. It's reactive to the music. So it beats according to the sound of each heart and everything is textured really nicely. We have a really awesome designer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Derek everybody, everybody killed it. Yeah. Yeah. He and, then, and just to piggyback on what you said, Michelle, as well, don't forget if you purchase even one of the hearts, you get the full song. It's a full five minute Tokyo Cyber Heart song that yeah. you can't get anywhere else. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. We're really looking forward to it. And then if you follow us, you'll learn more about the concert. And then you'll also learn about the third drop is going to be memory. So you're going to have really cute avatars. The avatars and the metaverse virtual mm -hmm. venue is, is super dope. I'm really excited about it. Damon, what is one piece of advice that you have for the community? Wow. My biggest piece of advice is what I told myself when I jumped in and started doing stuff with you guys is just go for it. Like, don't be afraid of it. Just start learning. Nobody's going to judge you. If you come into a Twitter spaces or a clubhouse or anything, you can know absolutely zero and everybody on there will show you love. They'll help guide you in the right direction. But I would say on the flip side of that, I think the only negative thing I will say is if you are going to launch something, make sure you build the community first. Don't try to throw it out there. Like definitely make a conscious effort to start building your community. And that can start with your closest friends and then it can start to build out. Damon, what are some challenges that you have gone through that you've overcome? Your advice is really go for it. What if someone oh. gets discouraged or gets depressed? Well, I mean, trust me, like I said, I've been there. I had a few years of super dark voices and I went through lots of therapy. I don't want to get too holistic or whatever, but meditation, working out, eating clean, limiting any alcohol and drug intake, and really not listening to those dark voices, not letting fear and pride get in the way because we all do that and we all allow it to happen, especially now with social media. People are cyber bullies, you know what I mean? Don't listen to those people. Like I literally had somebody the other day email me kind of a very negative kind of emails. Oh, I can't believe you worked on this. And oh, you lose street cred with me and blah, 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 blah. And instead of taking it negative, I just kind of went, you know what? 
I must be doing something right in building my brand if they're upset about me working with this person and not working with that person. And I always have. I chose to look at it as glass half full and not glass half empty. I know some people are innately one or the other. And I think if you are the other and you look at things always as glass half empty, try and find a way to flip that on its head and just look at things positively. And instead of going, oh man, I missed out on this opportunity, say, hey, you know what? I missed out on this opportunity, but now I have time for X, Y, and Z opportunities. Yeah. How do you know that you're good enough? Well, I'll be totally honest. And I've said this on a million podcasts. I feel <laughs> like work ethic trumps talent. I don't think you have to be the best. I think if you outwork somebody, you will have success. If you're the last man, woman standing, you will have success. Like you just can't take no for an answer, right? Because with every no, you're that much closer to a yes. So yeah. that's what I've seen, at least in the almost 25, 30 years since I've been chasing my dreams. That's the consistent thing I've seen. The people that have stayed in there, it will always connect at some point. And you can't guarantee it's going to be a minimal success or massive success, but something will manifest if you just stay the course. Yeah. So no is knowing or no is no K-N-O-W. Like impossible is impossible. Ooh, I don't know that acronym, but it's probably a good one, right? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, impossible is impossible. And then no is no or knowing so that your no something will come true. Yep. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's awesome to have you on here. Okay, bye-bye. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Bye-bye.